matter what our stories are, no matter what our perspective is, we gather here today because we have a common faith and a love for Jesus. And that's a good thing that binds us together. This morning as we worship and as we consider what it means to run the race, the Christian race, to be a disciple of Christ, take heed to the, to the warning and to the encouragement that we will look at this morning to keep running, to never give up, to not stop. No matter what's happening in our world, no matter what's happening in your life, there are times and times you want to quit. And God is saying, keep going. There are others around you that are running beside you. Keep running. There are those who run before you. Keep running. There are those who are running to that eternal prize just like you. So keep running. This morning as we worship, let's worship the God who loves us, the one and only God of the universe, the one who has made a way for us uh, to spend eternity with as we begin, if you don't mind, let's stand, and we're going to read God's Word. We've been looking at some of the call narratives in our Bible classes. This is from the call narrative of Isaiah, from Isaiah chapter 6. As he comes into the presence of God, he recognizes that God is holy and that he is so incredibly unholy. This morning, as we gather in the presence of God, understanding that God is with us, we are humble because God is perfect and holy, and we are anything but yet he allows us to enter into his presence. He allows us into the throne room to, to be with him, to worship him. So worship this morning with all your heart. Let's read this from Isaiah 6, verse 3. Read this out loud. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory.
Let's all pray. Our Father, as we're gathered here in this assembly this morning, we just want to thank you so much for the leadership that we have in this congregation, for their spirituality, their concern for each and every one of us, and help our leaders be consoled and comforted and understanding that you approve of what they do and that you encourage them. You know, in each of our lives, Father, may we listen to the spirit that you are giving us through your word. May we respond to it and be careful to remember it to make it work in our lives. Help us to always be open and willing to listen to your spirit as it speaks to us. And when we have the opportunities, the calls of service, may we be ever joyed in the opportunity to be involved in this response. Lord, help us to always respond to your will in our lives, to look at it, not let the other things that we are involved in in this world and the cares and the things that come up, help us to listen to your call and direct our lives in ways that you wish us to do. and help us to worship you in all spirit and truth, to listen to your will and to follow the ways that you wish us to worship and not to want to worship in ways that give us a good feeling, but rather to give you a good feeling. Help us to always be committed to your call before everything that we may wish to do. As we read your text in your Bible, help us to seek the guidance in our lives and to not let the cares of the world and the wishes of Satan so direct our thinking and our actions. And Father, may we always seek and be excited about worshiping you and not let the other things come into our mind that deflects from us seeking to worship with our brothers and sisters and to glorify your name. These things we pray in your son's name. Amen. When the peace like a
Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. 
focus our minds and hearts this morning around the Lord's Supper, I want to begin by reading from Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. He goes on to give some conditions for that. He says if we consent and obey and not refuse and not rebel. To understand a little more what it means to be whiter than snow, I want to turn to the 51st Psalm and read a few verses there. Be gracious to me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the greatness of thy compassion, blot out transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, I have sinned, and done what is evil in thy sight, so that thou art justified when thou dost speak, and blameless when thou dost judge. Verse 7. Purify me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Verse 9. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Those conditions, if we consent and obey. You know, when I came to Christ, I consented and I obeyed. Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. And I repented and I consented and I obeyed. And in the waters of baptism, I followed Jesus into the grave. And then he raised me up, a new creature, white as snow. And it was a beautiful, beautiful day, a beautiful thing. When John the Baptist looked at Jesus, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Let's all take the bread after I pray and remember our Savior who made us whiter than snow. Let's bow. Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for making us whiter than snow, cleansing us of our sin. We praise you for your plan for our lives. We praise you for your sacrifice. And we thank you for the church and others that encourage us as we meet around your table. And Lord, we reaffirm our love for you and our gratitude in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to keep reading in the 51st Psalm, verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from thy presence, and do not take thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of thy salvation, and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners will be converted to thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation. Then my tongue will joyfully sing thy righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, that my mouth may declare thy praise. For thou dost not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. Thou art not pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are, God are a broken heart, a broken and contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. 
Remember those conditions, do not refuse and do not rebel. After I was immersed in the Christ and became that new creation, it wasn't too many years later that I did some refusing and I did some rebelling. And I hope none of you can relate to that, but it happened in my life. And I'm so comforted by our, our relationship with God because he says very, very clearly that we can repent and he will cleanse us. 1 John, verses 1 through 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's pray over the cup. Thank you, Lord, for our covenant with you. We know it's based on Jesus, our Savior, and his willingness to offer himself and his willingness to give his life and the most precious thing that ever uh, was on this earth, his blood, to make peace with us and to reconcile us to you and pay the price for our sin. As we take this cup, help us to remember that and help us all to recommit to you and, and reaffirm our allegiance to our Savior Jesus. And we ask that in his name. Amen. God has given so much to us. It's an opportunity for our members here to give back just a, a small portion of what we've been given. I want to read about the widow's might because it's not about amounts that we give. It's about the sacrifice. Mark 12, verse, verses 41 through 44. And he, Jesus, sat down opposite the treasury and began observing how the multitude were putting money into the treasury, and many rich people were putting in large sums. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which amount to a cent. And calling his disciples to him, he said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all the contributors to the treasury, for they all put in out of their surplus, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she owned, all she had to live on. Let's pray over the offering. Lord, we pray that you'll accept our offering. We pray that, first of all, we give ourselves as a living sacrifice. Lord, to keep ourselves unstained by this world and to be good disciples of our Savior Jesus, to be a strength and encouragement to each other. And then as we give out of our means, Lord, we pray that we do so sacrificially, and we pray that these resources are all used to bring great glory to you, to further your kingdom, and to let our light shine even brighter here at Edmond. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. As the mountains around Jerusalem, so the
This morning's scripture reading will be from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 36 through 39. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. And but, by, but my righteous one will live by faith, and I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. Well, good morning. It's time now for Children's Bible Hour and Toddle Time. The, 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 uh, the numbers, the numbers, the ages are on the screen. I can't speak. Why do I speak up here? Uh, children's three-year-old through second grade are eligible for Bible Hour and nursery. Uh, basically, here's the deal. Please uh, stand. We're going to sing a song, and if your children or child would like to be part of this, be dismissed and you'll be escorted where you need to go. College students, normally somebody better is up here. <laughs> the joy of the Lord will be my strength. I will not falter, I will not faint. He is my shepherd, I am not afraid. The joy of The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord will be my strength. He will uphold me all of my days. I am surrounded by mercy and grace. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord will be my strength. I will not waver walking by faith. He will be strong to joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Please be seated. Someone once said, it doesn't matter how slowly you run, so long as you don't stop. As many of us know, running the race as a follower of Christ can be difficult. There's always unexpected obstacles to overcome and unwanted pain to manage. It's easy to stop. But scripture reassures us that any obstacle or pain we face pales in comparison to what awaits us at the finish line. It's not about getting there first. It's about running with purpose and with peace. The end of Hebrews tells us how to do that, how to keep on running life's amazing race to victory. We are in a series on the last chapters in the book of Hebrews. It's really more of a sermon than it is a book. It's written that way. We are looking at chapters 10 through 13, and that really is the so what part of the sermon. It is the encouragement that comes to those first century Jewish Christians, and then by extension, to all of us, to keep running the race, to not give up, to not throw in the towel, but to keep putting one foot in front of the other and keep living the life of a disciple of Christ. If you have a Bible, you might open it up to Hebrews chapter 10 or, or use your device. A lot of the scriptures will be on the screen this morning, but sometimes it's nice to have them right in front of you so you can check what is happening and see the context and do some other things. So we'll be in Hebrews chapter 10 this morning, the end of that chapter. Let me ask you a question. Why do some people commit their lives to Christ? They hear the gospel. They respond to the gospel they say, yes, I want to surrender my life to Jesus. But then along the way, something happens, and they decide, you know what? I can't do it anymore. I don't want to do it anymore. And they decide to walk away. They decide to give up on faith. 
We've all seen it happen, unfortunately. Maybe sometimes loved ones, family, friends, maybe even you. Maybe you are trying to find your way back. And I'm thankful. I'm thankful that God has you here and he has you on that journey. Or maybe it's you right now. Maybe you feel that way. And that you want to be a faithful follower of Jesus, but boy, there is just so much happening. There's so much going on in your life and in this world. You feel the pressure, and it feels like you're losing your grip. You're trying to hang on, but it feels like you're losing your grip. Well, I'm glad you're here too, because this message, the end of Hebrews, is for you. Speaking of hanging on, back in my younger days, I used to occasionally go to Colorado and rappel off some of those mountains up there. I remember the very first time I did that. I went with a church group up to Colorado. I was a teenager, and we were going to hike to the top of not just one mountain that week, but three mountains that week. And the first day on the trail, we spent the whole day rappelling. And the cliff was like a hundred foot sheer rock face. It was this huge cliff. Now, if you have rappelled before, then you know the routine. They take a rope, and they tie one rope to a very solid, hopefully solid, boulder or tree. Today, our tree is going to be the podium. I know you're worried that it's going to hold me up. I am too. We'll see. Yeah, the tree would normally be bigger than this. And so they anchor one rope to a tree or to a huge boulder. That rope then fits through a stainless steel figure eight that is on your harness and it goes through it runs through as you go down the mountain there's another rope that is the belay line the belay rope and there's a person at the top of the cliff who is anchored in and who has that rope usually tied around them and they feed you that rope as you go down the cliff constantly keeping tension on that rope so you have two ropes really holding you there you can't go anywhere, right? You're not going to fall. It's perfectly safe. Have you seen these ropes? I was a teenager. I was nervous. I'm waiting my turn. Finally, it's my turn. And I get my harness on. The carabiners are on. The figure eight's there. I get the ropes all connected. I'm ready to go. I think, you know, I should probably take a look over the edge and see what it looks like. And so I walk up to the edge and I peek over and it looks something like this picture right here. That's not the actual picture, but it looked just like that. And then I remember turning around very quickly and thinking, what am I doing? Why would I even do this? God did not intend for us to walk on vertical surfaces. He intended for us to walk on horizontal surfaces. Why are these mean people making me do this? I don't like them. I thought, you know what? I could wait them out. I could just wait right here, just stand on the edge until it gets dark, and then we'd have to pack up and go in. But I knew they would stay there. We would do it in the dark. Trust me, we would have done it in the dark. And so I remember thinking, okay, I need to do this. So I back up to the edge of the cliff, my heels almost hanging over the cliff, every once in a while peeking over my shoulder. I'm nervous. My knees are probably knocking. My hands are probably shaking. I don't want to do it. And that's when my belay guy says, just act like you're sitting on air. How is that supposed to help? (laughs) I don't sit on air. I sit on chairs, solid things. I don't know how to act that way because I've never done it. That was not helpful at all. But see, the idea is that you lower your backside, your feet stay below you to center you, to give you a stable base, and you basically work your way down the rope, over the cliff, down the vertical edge, and you just simply walk on a vertical surface. Sounds easy, doesn't it? But when you're standing looking over the edge, it's not easy. So he says, just act like you're sitting in the air. And so I do this. (laughs) That's not sitting. Well, I'm getting there, okay? Give me time. He encourages me. He says, you got this. You can do this. The other people who are still left up there, most of whom have already gone and climbed back up there. (laughs) Remember, I tried to wait them out. They're encouraging me, you got this, you can do this, we can do this. All right, so now it's time to go. And so I take one foot, and I finally take a deep breath, and I say those magic words to the guy who is holding my rope and my life in his hands on belay. 
He says, belay on, and I take one step off the cliff, and then I stop. I wish it was like this, just a step there, but it was vertical. So I have one foot horizontal, I have one foot vertical, and I stop. And he says, relax. You need to relax. I guess, evidently, hanging from a rope on a 100-foot cliff with one foot horizontal and one foot vertical is not very relaxing. At least I didn't look relaxed. And so he tells me to relax. So again, I take a deep breath, and then I took my other foot down. And then you know what happened? The rope kind of fed out. I sort of looked around. I thought, hey, the hard part's over. And then I took another step. And then I took another step. And pretty soon, I started descending down that cliff. And you know what? It was even kind of fun. I stopped to look around a little bit. I thought, hey, this is all right. This is enjoyable. Now, since then, I have repelled several times. I've even gone head first. They call it Australian style. That's fun. It's a little different. But here's what I've learned about repelling. That first step is the hardest part. Getting over the edge, committing to it, taking that leap of faith. Not a leap, it's a step. Taking that step of faith, that is the hardest part. But then after that, you know, yes, it's still a little bit scary, but it's thrilling, it's an adventure, and you can't wait to get to the bottom, go back up and do it again. Now, you can maybe see some of the parallels between repelling and discipleship. Even if you've never repelled before, just from what I briefly described, you can see some connections there, can't you? You know, sometimes you look at the life of discipleship, and it's thrilling, it's exciting, but it's also, let's be honest, a little scary. Discipleship demands something from you. It calls for sacrifice and service. And so, yes, it's, it's an adventure, it's thrilling, it's exciting, but it's also a little bit frightening. You have people who are encouraging you. You have people giving you instructions, telling you where to step, what to do. You have people saying, you got this, you can do this. But you also have other voices, don't you? You have other voices criticizing you. Can you imagine if the people at the top of the mountain were saying, you can't do this. You don't have this. Hey, you're doing it all wrong. You're going to fall and hurt yourself. And that would change everything, wouldn't it? Hopefully you have someone in your life encouraging your walk with Christ. It is an adventure, but it also can be frightening. And as you continue to live the life of a disciple, you see that Sometimes it's not easy. Imagine that you repel 10 feet, 20 feet, maybe 30 feet. You still have quite a ways to go, but for whatever reason, you decide, you know what? I'm done. I don't want to go anymore. I don't like this. There's, there's an indention coming up. I don't know what to do there. My, you know, I can't, what do I do? My feet can't go in there. There are voices yelling at me. You know, there's obstacles, there's challenges. You know, this harness is hurting me. I, I'm, I'm sweating. I have this helmet on, these gloves on. It's not comfortable. I'm, I'm ready to stop. Now, you have two options, don't you? You can just let go. By the way, if you let go, your belay person will take care of you. You have people that will take care of you. You can go down to the bottom as quickly as you can. That's one way. Or you can do what? You can try your hardest to grab that rope and climb back up. That sounds brutal, doesn't it? It would be brutal. And yet that's what we do sometimes. Because see, this is the ground that is familiar. This is the ground that is safe. That down there is unpredictable. It's difficult. I'm going to go back up here where it's safe, back up here where it's comfortable and familiar. Now it would be very difficult to actually climb back up, depending on what kind of gear you had. They don't advise it. You shouldn't do it, right? And yet so many Christians, unfortunately, choose that. They've taken that initial step of faith. They've surrendered their life to Christ. But then life sets in, and the world presses in. And these voices in our head and these voices in the culture speak to us and pull us. And it gets difficult, comfortable. And we remember life before Christ, we remember life outside of Christ, and we think, you know what? That's more familiar. That's safer ground. I think I'll just climb back up. For the immediate audience of this sermon in Hebrews, 
That's exactly what they were trying to do. These Jewish Christians had surrendered their lives to Christ. They had given over their lives to Christ. They were following Christ as disciples, as followers of his. But then they decide, because of persecution, because of the difficulty of their day and their situation, they decide to grab the rope and begin climbing back up to go back for them, Judaism, to go back to what was familiar, to go back to what was comfortable. And by the way, the people at the top of the mountain were telling them to do that. They weren't saying, yes, you can do this, keep going. They were saying, get back up here. What are you doing down there? God didn't intend for us to walk on vertical surfaces. Get up here where it's flat. Then you have a culture around them who's also saying the same thing. You're gonna fall, you're gonna hurt yourself. You are crazy, what are you doing? And so they began to try to climb their way back up to what is safe, what is familiar. And so the whole sermon of Hebrews is written to them and then of course to us because we're no different. Our circumstances are different, but we aren't really that different. It's written to us to say, don't try to climb your way out of Christianity. Don't give up. Don't go back. Don't try to go where it's safe and familiar. Enjoy, embrace the adventure and the challenges that is discipleship. And so in our text today, he starts with a warning, a very stern warning. Look in your Bibles at Hebrews chapter, at chapter 10. We're going to start in verse 26. He says, If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of a raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. And so, remember, this is a Jewish audience here. He's saying, remember in the law, this is what happened when you rejected the law. A couple of witnesses testified, and it was bad time for you. He uses it as an example, and then he goes on to say, how much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, it is mine to avenge, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of of a living God. Wow. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of a living God if you are there all alone, if you are there without Jesus. Very strong words here, words that make you sit up and take notice. It's like going to the doctor and the doctor says, listen, I got to tell you, and he looks straight in your eyes and he says, if you don't blank, you're going to die. That gets your attention, doesn't it? If you don't exercise and eat right, you're going to die. If you don't stop smoking, you're going to die. If you don't take this medicine, you're going to die or get this treatment. If he or she says that to you, you're going to pay attention. This is a stern warning here. Basically, the writer is saying, if you don't blank, you're going to die. You say, well, wait a second. (laughs) I thought you said this was encouragement. That's the subtitle of this series, encouragement from Hebrews 10 through 13. That is not encouragement. That's scary. Why so serious? You know, sometimes the best form of encouragement is a dose of reality. And sometimes we just need to see whatever path we're on, we need to see what it looks like at the end of that path. And once we see what the end of that path looks like, we can make a decision. Oh, you know what? I don't, I don't want to go down that path. I don't want to end up there. I'm going to make a change. You see, encouragement comes in all forms. Who is this encouragement? Who is this warning for? We see in the text, verse 26, those who deliberately keep on sinning. Oh, wait a second. I'm not perfect. Are you saying once I become a Christian and let's say I, I sin, I mess up, then I'm going to face that consuming, raging fire? Or, or let's be honest, okay, I don't just mess up once, but I mess up once today, okay, once this hour, but then I messed up again today, and then I messed up again, and then tomorrow I might sin again. Is that, is that who he's talking about? I've got to face this consuming fire, this raging fire? I'll be punished forever? You know, that's what believers in the second and third century thought. Many of them thought that. 
You know what they did to try to get around that? They tried to delay their baptism as long as they could to preserve in their minds a sinless life before death. I mean, anything wrong with that plan? I mean, that doesn't work functionally, and it certainly doesn't work theologically. Imagine that. You know, some old boy gets hurt in a farming accident. Really bad. He's not going to make it. His family's gathered around his, his deathbed. Hey, Paul, do you have any last words? Yeah. Baptize me. <laughs> okay, let's drag him to the, to the pond and baptize him. Now, I'm all for deathbed confessions and conversions. God works in mysterious ways and at all times. But do you see anything wrong with that theology? You see, that mindset says, it's up to me. Salvation and forgiveness is up to me. So if I can manage it just right, control the situation, control the variables, then I can have my best chance to be saved. Forgiveness and salvation is not up to you and it's not up to me. It's God's work. That's what God does. Now this idea of once saved, always saved, that's not supported in Scripture. But this text and several texts in the New Testament remind us that salvation is lost when it is thrown away. There's a difference. There's a difference between lost and thrown away. You see, I had a shirt, this gray shirt. I had it for years. It was soft. It was a cool shirt. Well, that shirt disappeared out of my closet. I didn't lose it, evidently. My wife threw it away on purpose. It was time to get rid of it. You see, there's a difference between losing something and throwing something away. For this immediate audience, it seems to be he's referring to those who heard the gospel, accepted the gospel, became disciples of Christ, but because of persecution, because of temptation, they decided to reject Christ and go back to their former life, to go back to Judaism. They were halfway down the cliff, and they said, you know what, this isn't working, and they started climbing back up. And what does he say to them? He says, you want to go back? You want to go back to have your sins forgiven by animal sacrifices? Well, guess what? That won't work. That's the old covenant. We are in a new covenant there's a better sacrifice. We said last week that the writer of Hebrews spent nine and a half chapters saying that Jesus is better. Jesus is better in every way, and one of those ways is his sacrifice is better than any sacrifice that has come before, any sacrifice that will come after Jesus. It is the ultimate sacrifice that brings salvation to us. Only Jesus can forgive sins. And he says, if you reject him, what word does he use? You are trampling on the Son of God. You are walking over him and the sacrifice he made for you. And if you are trampling him and his sacrifice, what you're saying is, I don't want or I don't need his sacrifice. Well, without his sacrifice, the only sacrifice that takes away our sins, then we are still in our sin. And when we die, or the Lord comes back, we will appear before him still in our sin. And that's not where you want to be. Because your sin will separate you from a holy and a sinless God for all of eternity. In today's context, there's probably not many Christians who are trying to go back to Judaism. But there are several Christians who are trying to go back to life before Christ, to life without Christ, because it's familiar, because it's comfortable, because things seem to make more sense there, because a culture pulls us that way. It's the person who says, you know, this Jesus thing just isn't working anymore. I want to live my own truth. I want to do my own thing. I want to be my own boss. And those who choose this path, think about this, those who choose this path to walk away from Christ, to climb back up to what is familiar, what is comfortable, they are taking a huge risk, a huge gamble. And what they are risking, what they're gambling on, is that Jesus either wasn't real or that he wasn't serious. Jesus said, 
What good is it if you gain the whole world, the whole world, and yet forfeit your soul? Are you willing to take that gamble? People sometimes say, now wait a second. How can a loving God send people to hell? It's a good question. It's a good question that should be addressed. It's a question that, that taps into deep theology. Short version answer is, is this. Maybe it's not so much that God sends people to hell as he allows people to choose hell. Does that make sense? Throughout scripture, we see these words, God gave them over. God gave them over to their evil desires. God gave them over to their false worship. God gave them over to their shameful lust. What that means is God sees people walking down a path, and at some point, they're very defiantly walking down that path, and he says, okay, that's what you choose. I will give you over to that choice. You get to live your own truth. You get to do your own thing. You get to go wherever you want to go. He gives them over. He doesn't force you to follow Jesus. He doesn't force you to live a life of faithfulness, does he? Love never forces. But God will give us over. He's always waiting patiently for us to come home. And so maybe it's not so much that God sends people to hell, but he allows people to choose that if that's what they so choose. Look, look at these words in our text. Just look at these words I highlighted. Deliberately, rejected, trampled, treated as unholy, insulted. What do all those words and, and ideas have in common? They imply intent, don't they? That's not something you just stumble into. You don't stumble into rejecting Jesus. You don't just accidentally reject Jesus. You don't accidentally trample him or over him. No, you choose to do that. You defiantly choose to live your own life, make yourself Lord of your life. The enemies of God that he talks about here, those who face the raging and consuming fire, they are those who willfully choose to be enemies of Christ to oppose Christ. You ask, well, why would some people do that? Why would those first century Jewish Christians do that? Why would people do that today for the same reasons? Circumstances are different, but it's the same reasons. Because the life of a disciple of Christ isn't always easy. Because there are various forms of persecution. I hate to even use that word today compared to first century persecution. I mean, they, they were under the Emperor Claudius and then Nero, where they were just tortured and, and their livelihood taken from them and they were mistreated in so many ways. And our, our resistance looks different today, but there's resistance. Make no mistake, there is resistance today. And life of discipleship is sometimes difficult. It does demand sacrifice. It does demand sometimes altering priorities, letting go of the values of the world, it's so much easier just to, to, to consume what is here and what is now. And that's why so many people do go back to that safe ground. Because the rewards are tangible. They are immediate. I can see this world that I am trying to gain. And I think that's one of the reasons why the writer of Hebrews continues to put up a different vision he continues to say, look beyond the here and the now. Let your gaze transcend your circumstances and look to eternity. He continually puts this picture of eternity. He says, that's what we're going for, not this. It's the finish line. It's eternity. And he does that even in our text. Look back at verse 32. He says, first of all, look back. And then he says, look up. Remember those earlier days, look back, after you had received the light, when you endured in a great conflict full of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times, you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. He says, this hardship that you're facing, it's nothing new. You've been there, done that. You faced it yourselves. Your brothers and sisters faced it, and you stood by their side. Endurance in the past should inspire 
strength for your present sufferings. He says, look back. But he also says, look up. You see what he says there in verse 34? This better and lasting home, better and lasting possessions. We already said that Hebrews is filled with that word better. Jesus is better in all of these ways. And now he says, it's not just Jesus who is better, but the way that he makes for you is better. The life that he has for you is better. Eternity spent with Jesus is better. And so focus on what is better. Let your eyes transcend your circumstances. Don't throw away your, look at the word he uses, your confidence. That's an interesting word. Last week in the beginning of chapter 10, he used that word. We approach the the throne room. We go into the holy of holies with confidence, with boldness, that word means. So he says, you don't just have confidence or boldness to enter into the presence of God. You have confidence or boldness to face whatever comes your way because you are in the presence of God. It is better. Think about what you have to live the life that God has called you to live. Sometimes I think we forget. We forget what we have. We think we're, we're ill-equipped to live the life of a disciple. Paul reminds us in 2 Timothy chapter 1, for the Spirit of God, you have the Spirit. The Spirit of God that he gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power and love and self-discipline. So don't be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord and of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me and suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He says, you have what you need. You have power, not from yourself, not from your ability, your knowledge, your experience, but from God. He infuses your life with power through his spirit. So don't be timid. Don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid. Live with power, emboldened to face whatever comes your way, making much of Jesus through it all. Yes, discipleship is different. It's difficult. But we are to keep running. We are to not shrink back. Before the 1912 Olympic Games in Stockholm, Sweden, a Japanese marathon runner named Shizo Kanakori qualified for his country. He actually set a world record in the marathon at that time in the qualifying round. So he was one of two runners from Japan who they sent to run the marathon in the 1912 Olympics. The odd thing is, Kanakori disappeared from the race. (laughs) It had taken him 18 days to get there by ship and by train. He was exhausted. He was worn out. It took him five days to recover, but then it was time to run the race. And so he started the race, but somewhere along the way, about halfway through, he fell unconscious. His body couldn't take it. He ended up being taken in and cared for by a local family. Well, race officials didn't know what happened to him. You know, communication was a lot different back then. They didn't know what happened to him. When he came to and got healthy and strong, he was so ashamed, he was so embarrassed because of his, what he called his failure, he decided just to quietly go home. So he went back to Japan. He just stopped running. He just quit the race. Unfortunately, that's what some people do when it comes to running the race for Jesus. Circumstances, difficulties, loss, persecution, confusion, doubts, selfishness, all of these things start to press in on us. And one day, we just decide, I'm done. And we stop running. Hebrews offers a better and a lasting reality that transcends this reality. Look back at verse 36. He says, you need to persevere. You need to keep going. You need to keep running so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. Our hope, our joy, our reason for running the race is not because we trust in this world. This world will let you down. This world will deceive you. And it's not because we trust necessarily the crowd around us. Many times people will let you down. People will hurt you. And it's certainly not because we trust ourselves to save ourselves. It is because we trust in the one, the only one, who can save us. 
You see, our hope and our home, they are not in this reality. They are in an otherworldly reality that is in the presence of a loving Father and His precious Son. That's where our home is, and that's where our hope is. The writer of Hebrews is building up to this crescendo in this chapter 10. So look back at verse 37 as he quotes one of their Old Testament prophets. Remember, he's talking to first century Jews. They know their Hebrew Bibles. And so when he mentions these quotations, it rings a bell. For, he says, in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. And, but my righteous one will live by faith. And I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. He goes on to say, but we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. Quoting Habakkuk, who again, they understand, they know their Hebrew Bibles. They know that this quotation from Habakkuk comes from when Babylon came in and started oppressing and taking over the southern kingdom of Israel. And yet, in that point in history, God was still God, still taking care of his covenant people, despite very negative circumstances. So he taps into that collective memory. And he says, despite the hardship you're facing, despite the persecution, there will be deliverance. So what should we do? Verse 38, we should live by live by faith. That will be a theme in the text to come. What's the very next chapter? We're in chapter 10 of Hebrews, chapter 11. What's Hebrews chapter 11? The great faith hall of fame, right? This catalog of men and women who lived and died by faith. Life was difficult for many of them. It demanded sacrifice of them, and yet they lived and died by faith. That's how we are to live. We take that initial step that is the most difficult step by faith, but every step we take after that is a step of faith. We live by faith because we are God's people. You know, sometimes we need to know what to do, and sometimes we need to know who we are. In verse 39, we're reminded who we are. We are not a people who shrink back and are destroyed. We are a people who have faith and are saved. You see, the whole idea of climbing the rope to get back on this safe ground is that we think we will save ourselves. We don't want to die. We don't want to be in pain. And what happens is we end up with the very thing that we're trying to avoid. What does he say? We are not those who shrink back and are destroyed, but we are those who live by faith and are saved. Real disciples don't retreat. They keep running, and they advance Christ and his kingdom. He says, keep running. Keep moving forward. Keep putting your eyes on eternity. No matter what trial or temptation comes your way, It's worth it. God's got it. You have a heavenly home that comes in focus when you live by faith, when you hold on to the promises of God. Well, there's more to the story of the Japanese marathon runner. Whatever happened to him? He went back to Japan, and Swedish authorities considered him missing for 50 years. They had no idea. For 50 years. And then in 1967, They, after discovering that he was back in Japan, they made an offer to him, an invitation. They said, we want you to come and finish the race. (laughs) And so he took them up on on their offer. He came back and he finished the marathon. In the time of 54 years, eight months, six days, five hours, 32 minutes, and 20.3 seconds. Now, I think I might be able to compete with him. (laughs) When they asked him about it, he said, yeah, it was a long, long journey. He said, along the way, I got married. (laughs) I had six children. I had ten grandchildren. (laughs) That's quite a break, right? But he finished the race. Listen, if you're hanging on and you feel like you're losing your grip, 
Don't try to climb your way out of it. Don't give up. You can finish the race. You can do it. Focus your eyes on eternity. Try to look beyond your circumstances. Look beyond the craziness and chaos of this world, the evil that is so prevalent among us. And rather than retreating in fear or doubt or temptation and sin, advance. Advance Christ and his kingdom. If we can help you do that, we want to. If you're ready today to give your life to Christ, don't delay. Confess your faith and be baptized into Christ. Begin that that life of Christ. Step over. Make that step of faith. Do that today. If we can encourage you and pray for you, let us do that. A couple of our shepherds and their wives will be in the parlor. It's a little room in the hallway behind me. They'd be happy to visit with you and pray for you. You can just exit and make your way there, and they'd be glad to greet you. Or you can come down to the front. We just invite you to come as we stand together and sing. Be with me, Lord, I cannot live without Thee. I dare not try to take one step alone. I cannot Almighty, great Jehovah God, and Father, we, we are so very thankful for today, for this morning. And Father, we're thankful for the break in the weather that you've given us, and uh, just another day in your creation. And Lord, we know that we're sinful people, that we're broken, and obviously that's why Christ came here to, to pay that ultimate sacrifice for us, Father. But we know that we struggle in this world and, and we tend to waffle and go back and forth between the things of this world and the things of you. And Father, we, we just ask that you bless us with that strength to stand firm, to continue on, to fight that good fight and to not, to not shrink back. And forgive us when we do, Father. Forgive us when we do fall back and, and help us to learn from those lessons and then run even closer to you moving forward, Father. We do thank you for Christ and, and his sacrifice and the love that was shown to us and all the mercy and grace that you so freely give to us that we, we do not earn or, or deserve. But thank you for that, Father. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Good morning. It's good to see everybody here today. And Randy, if, I don't know if he's still there. Oh, there you are. If there's a next time you do this illustration, the baptistry is right there. Just repel off of that for us. Missed opportunity, man. Missed opportunity. The QR code is on the screen behind me. If you didn't have a chance to use that and check in, we'd love to know that you're here and with us today. If you're visiting, you're our special guest, and we'd love for you to visit with one of our ministers. His name is Kevin Rayner. He's out at the welcome table. He's happy to answer any questions or do anything that you need today. We do have a couple of people we'd like to add to the prayer list today. We are extending our sympathy to a couple of families, to Nick Sanders in the death of his grandfather, 
and also to the friends and family of Twyla Turner. So please add them to your prayer list this week. We're very happy to share with you on a, a different note that George Morris was recently baptized. So if you see George around the building here or out and about, welcome him to the church family. He is uh, on a new walk and we want to encourage him in every way that we can. Believe it or not, college students at Oklahoma Christian moved into their dorms and apartments yesterday. And so many of them are here today and they'll all be back next week because school starts on Thursday for them, believe it or not. And UCO begins on August 22nd. So as you see them around the building, uh, welcome them and send them our way to the class in the chapel. This evening at five o'clock, we have our Sunday night for the master and we'll have a meal followed by a devotional. And as always, we'll have lots of ministry opportunities as well. Next Sunday night is our annual Beginnings and Blessings worship service, and it's our opportunity to bless all of our students and families and anyone associated with education. Our teachers, the teacher's aides, administrators, lunch ladies, if you have any part in educating our children, we want to pray for you and ask God's blessings on you this year. So be here for that next Sunday evening. Immediately following that, we'll have an ice cream fellowship. And hopefully you saw that in your classes today and signed up to bring ice cream. I forget what Jeremy's favorite ice cream is. He'll probably put a plug in for it soon. But uh, we love the homemade ice cream on that night. That's after beginnings and blessings. Um, this year, 2022, is a significant year in the history of the Edmund Church of Christ. And it's significant because it was a, an important year in 1922. It was the year that the church began at the little gym theater. We're going to be celebrating in the fall, and we have a short video sort of explaining some more about that. Let's watch it together. I'm standing in downtown Edmond. More specifically, I'm at 17 South Broadway in downtown Edmond, the former location of the Gym Theater, and more importantly for us, the very first meeting place of the Edmond Church of Christ. In early November of 1922, 13 men and women met right here in this place for the very first worship service and Bible study for our congregation. Now since then, obviously our church home has moved down the road a little bit. From here it went to 4th and Boulevard, and then to 1101 East 9th, and then to our current location at the corner of Bryant and 9th. In 100 years, a lot has happened, and some things have changed, but some things have also not changed. Our commitment to God and God's Word, our love for Jesus and our neighbor, and our desire to be a light in this community and in this world. So please, on November 6th, join us. Mark your calendars, November 6th. We want to celebrate what God has done and pray that God would continue to do great things in us and through us, to be a light in this community and in this world. On that day, November 6th, we're going to bring back former members and former ministers. We're going to have a great time of celebration, a special worship service. We're going to serve our community. We're going to specifically get out in our community and serve our community. And then on that day, we're going to have a very special announcement about a project that will bless not only our church family, but we think will bless this community as well. I'm very excited about that. So invite friends, invite former members to join you and plan to be a part of our centennial celebration on Sunday, November 6th, as we celebrate 100 years as a light in this community. Mm -hmm. After 100 years, we certainly have a lot to celebrate and a lot to look forward to. I will note that, I think it was in the bulletin this week, one of the first 13 people that met in November of 1922 was a student at what is now the University of Central Oklahoma. College students have been an important part of this church for 100 years. And we've been loving college students for just as long. Thank you again for being here today. We hope that you have a great week and that you run an amazing race. We are dismissed. <laughs>